We are going to start with a brief video by Patrick Dwyer, who's an autistic graduate student doing autism research at UC Davis. His research focuses on autistic sensory processing, and he also has strong side interests um, in various topics such as education, intervention, and neurodiversity theory. He is a co-chair of the Autistic Researchers Committee at the International Society for Autism Research, and he facilitates a, a really strong peer support community for autistic students at UC Davis. And he has a blog, autisticscholar.com. Hello, I'm Patrick Dwyer. I am an autistic person. I do autism research. There, that's my very quick introduction to myself. Uh, and to get straight into things, um, I wanted to ask you to think back to the 1990s. Uh, back then, the autism world uh, was completely dominated by uh, this medical pathology approach to autism that treats autistic people as deficient, as broken. Uh, frankly, back then, autistic people uh, were seen as less than fully human. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, in many cases. Um, so interventions aimed to make autistic people uh, more neurotypical. This was seen as an end of it in itself. And unfortunately, this ended up causing a lot of stress um, uh, and problems to autistic people. Uh, for example, uh, stimming, you know, repetitive motor movements, hand flapping, etc. Um, these are things that can be fun and pleasurable for many autistic people. Uh, they're also an important regulatory approach for regulating stress, and yet they're being suppressed. Uh, eye contact, which is experienced as stressful by many autistic people, is being forced on people. And Furthermore, uh, back then you've actually got aversives being widely used, uh, people being punished. So lots of problems in these approaches, uh, but even more fundamentally, this is aiming at suppressing autism, making people appear more neurotypical. Uh, in short, it's aimed at camouflaging autism, at hiding autism. And this is something that autistic people have found to be stressful and exhausting. Um, and new research is showing that it's linked to mental health problems. So even back in the 1990s, autistic advocates were starting to understand a lot of this and were banding together, organizing, pushing back against these approaches. And it was in that process that Judy Singer, um, an autistic person who is studying sociology in Australia, coined the term neurodiversity. So, this term neurodiversity, um, first of all, has a factual meaning. It refers to the diversity of all human minds and brains. Um, all of us do have different minds and brains. So that means that any group of humans is going to be neurodiverse. Um, any group of humans will include people with different minds and brains. But then there's also these terms neurodivergent or neurominority. These are terms specifically for those of us whose minds and brains are uh, so different um, from what's considered typical uh, and in ways that are you know, associated with sufficient challenges that um, we are considered uh, to have disabilities. So this is just factual content, um, but there's also a political movement here. Judy Singer wasn't just saying, yeah, neurodiversity is a thing. Diversity is seen as a good thing. Biodiversity is seen as a good thing. Ethnic diversity is seen as a good thing. And by people in the neurodiversity movement, neurodiversity is seen as a good thing. This is a movement that's still evolving and changing. So some people might um, have different ideas about exactly what the neurodiversity movement is. Um, but basically it is uh, a political movement that applies to autism and a lot of other different neurotypes, some of which are listed here. Uh, exact extent could be somewhat debated. Um, and it rejects attempts to cure or normalize neurodivergent people as an end in itself. Uh, we do acknowledge the existence of challenges and disability as a general rule. Um, we're not burying our heads in the sand or something, as they say. Um, but we do seek to increase quality of life through different approaches that aren't aimed at normalization as an end in itself. So for example, this could mean reforming society. Um, or it could mean teaching adaptive skills to the person. Um, and we 
um, will even permit medical cures for medical problems, not autism itself, but co-occurring health conditions. And perhaps most importantly, the neurodiversity movement, uh, well, quality of life is important, but very importantly, the neurodiversity movement is advocating for rights, for equity, for inclusion for people. Because um, the fact is that neurodivergent and disabled people do face a lot of discrimination. There's actually some really fascinating and disturbing studies by people like Noah Sasson and others that have found that autistic people uh, are judged negatively by others almost instantly. You show people just a short video clip of an autistic person um, and they immediately form a negative impression. Uh, so this, you know, could results in lots of discrimination and formal legal protections, non-discrimination non legislation like the ADA can't fully counter this. Moreover, um, disability can sometimes be used as an explicit justification for overt discrimination in ways that uh, you know, wouldn't be tolerated when it comes to other forms of diversity like uh, ethnic diversity. So for example, uh, when I was starting to study psychology as an undergraduate, one of the intro psych instructors, uh, a really great guy, really nice guy and a really brilliant teacher, um, but, one of, but um, uh, his, one of his children um, was diagnosed as autistic. And at that time, uh, the immigration policy of Canada was that no individual with a disability was allowed in, period. Full stop. It's changed since then somewhat, um, but uh, he was uh, deported. Um, the family was deported, um, and that was because of autism. And here I am now, an international autistic student in the United States. Um, it's somewhat disquieting. And this is just one example of discrimination. And I'm a white cisgender guy. So I have some privileges there, some protection, but contrary to stereotypes, uh, and as we're going to be hearing later in this panel, many autistic people are not white cisgender guys. Thank you so much, Patrick, for your view. I am now going to introduce Elizabeth Morgan. She is a community health program supervisor at our USED, as well as a doctoral candidate in human development. Her area of focus is early intervention services with a specific interest in underrepresented populations. She is also a very proud parent of a child with autism and is very active in the developmental disability parent community as an active board member for Warmline Family Resource Center and a founder of the Sankofa Parent Group. Good afternoon. My name is Elizabeth Morgan and I identify as a black dyslexic mother scholar of a child on the autism spectrum. And I will expand on Patrick's last points, really introducing this concept and idea of intersectionality. So first, I really think it's important to have some definition and context when we're thinking about this term. So, Intersectionality is a term used to describe the interlocking oppressions that individuals experience based on their embodiment of two or more marginalized identities. The concept was first discussed in a publication uh, in 1979, uh, written by a group of Black feminists and activists entitled the Kumbahi River Collective statement, and it was later coined by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, who's a law professor. This term was used to describe the experiences of layers of oppression that persons or groups of people experience when multiple characteristics of their identities collide with social and structural power systems, such as racism, sexism, and ableism, just to name a few. So for instance, when people on the autism spectrum are from racial or ethnic communities affected by systemic and systematic racism and sexism, using an intersectional lens is extremely important. 
So what does that mean for you and I? I am glad you asked. Well, as a physician, therapist, or teacher, any of you that are taking part today that fit under that category, this means that knowing the multiple identities of your patients, clients, and students, what, how they, what they possess and how those identities impact them and, give, and have multiple burdens upon, of oppression upon them on a daily basis. Knowing this can provide an opportunity for you to give person-centered, high-quality care. For our ASD researchers and scientists, this means that doing the hard yet thoughtful work at every phase of your research, and including the ideas of BIPOC and autistic scholars, and as well as community activists in these communities, while conducting a critical analysis of your data by continuously asking yourself the questions of how does race, gender, class, and orientation impact my data and my outcomes. So my hope is that you will find this panel to be stimulating and engaging and will integrate the words and the experiences of our panelists to give you a deeper understanding of how neurodiversity and intersectionality affect your practice. Enjoy your time. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I now have the opportunity to introduce Jackie Armstrong and we are going to have a little conversation. She is an advocate from Roseville, California, which is just near Sacramento. She was diagnosed at an early age with autism, as well as an often unrecognized learning difference called nonverbal learning disability. She has an associate's degree in arts and culture from Sierra College. She works at SMUD, which is our Sacramento Utilities, um, part-time, as well as volunteering with a touch of understanding, teaching children about disability and empathy. She's also the Vice President of Sacramento United People First and is a public speaker um, speaking about inclusion and employment first. How are you doing, Jackie? I'm pretty good, thank you for asking. Great. So I'm going to start with just asking you how you've experienced the world being a woman on the spectrum. Okay, so I'm going to break it down to two different things. One would be action and one would be um, uh, appearance. So action. So women are expected to be quiet and dainty and warm and friendly. And then always with perfect hair and a full face of makeup. So when excited, I am loud in your face and can be considered ostentatious. And I also struggle a bit with standing too close to people sometimes. So the whole COVID thing, suddenly learning this is your bubble and then your bubble is now six feet apart, <clears throat> a little bit of uh, struggle. Now, when I say ostentatious, um, so when I'm excited, I often blurt out things in a rapid, almost Tourette's-like manner. Sometimes it's trivia and sometimes it's what I'm thinking. Now, when people joke that they have no filter, they mean they may say things that embarrass them, but they really don't know what it's like to blurt something out before your mind has even been able to process what you were saying or say, hey, maybe keep that to yourself. With men, that's okay to blurt things out. In fact, there's an entire section of Seth Rogen movies all about men being allowed to blurt out all kinds of things, but it has been detrimental to people that want to get to know me. And people sometimes miss the wonderful, awesome lady behind all the unusual ways of speaking. Now, women are often supposed to come off as warm and sometimes I come off as aloof and uncaring when someone says, oh, somebody died of a skiing accident. And I was like, oh, were they wearing a helmet? And it's not, it's not that I don't care. I just want to know the facts. And most other women may be like, oh, that's so sad things. Um, a lot of people think that I don't have empathy, but it's more that I have an overabundance of empathy and that I just don't know what to do with it. It's, um, it's similar with the sensory processing disorders that um, come with being on the spectrum. So instead, you know, just like with sound being too intense, uh, the empathy is so intense, I just don't know what to do with it. Uh, finally, uh, uh, 
Patrick touched on this and it's called masking or camouflaging. I'm really good at faking it. I'm going to do it now. Hi, everybody. How's it going today? Are you having a good day? Um, I do that all day long. And it also involves having to suppress the Tourette's like blurting. And it often feels like I've run a marathon by the time I get home. And sometimes uh, I'll get home and wind up sleeping like I just got out of surgery or something. And it can be detrimental because if I disclose of people of being on a spectrum, I risk people accusing me of lying. I actually had somebody accuse me of faking it to get Alta services, despite the fact that um, I was kicked out of ABA at 12 because of the threats like blurting. Do you think your gender has affected your disclosing your diagnosis? Um, I think that um, uh, camouflaging does happen more in women. It's been studied, but um, and that women's, uh, let's see, women's interests tend to be more um, in, in vogue with things that, so it may get missed more often, I guess. Um, so, you know, a girl that is talking 24 seven about horses may be less alarming to a parent than uh, somebody else who's talking obsessively about vacuum cleaners, I guess. So um, it's, it's a little different. Um, I'm gonna go into the appearance piece. Um, so hygiene, um, I'm 35 and I just learned uh, within the past month how to uh, keep my hair to where it's not constantly all over the place. Um, um, with sensory, um, the hair dryer, and then anything that um, uh, makeup wise goes on my like eyes or eyelashes, I can't do it. It's just too, it's too strong. It feels like you're putting mud in my eyes. So I oftentimes don't wear makeup and women are supposed to look professional and presentable. And so how do you interact with someone that, you know, doesn't wear makeup and doesn't always follow these things. And that also has to do with how people, um, I guess there's a rule about not wearing a same outfit twice. Whereas in high school, I was, I wore the same uh, old Navy sweater so much that everybody called me old Navy. So things like that will come up or, you know, if someone wears the same outfit as me, I'm not going to get mad. I usually come up and I say, Oh my gosh, you're wearing the same outfit. That's awesome. You know? So my reactions are a little different than what, and finally, um, sometimes between women, there's a subtle infighting going on where they may not get along with each other. And I'm so oblivious to that, that I have no idea anyone's picking on me. So I'm, constantly living a life of oblivion bliss in a way that I don't pick up on all the microaggressions that other women might. So mm -hmm. that's the other piece. Thank you so much. That was uh -huh. wonderful. How do you think being a woman on the spectrum has shaped your work experiences? Um, so I used to work at a um, shelter workshop and I advocated to be in the electronics manufacturing because I thought that would be something that I might enjoy. And I wound up being um, evaluated for that and they found a skill set that they did not expect. And so I wound up being the first woman in a almost completely all male department. I was the first woman on the spectrum to break the, the, the gender barrier there where I was the first lady to be putting medical dev devices together. Um, and then when I finally broke away from the sheltered workshop, I went into a company where in my specific department, almost all of my coworkers are female. And I always had friends that were guys. I preferred friends that were guys. And so having that, having that piece allowed me to learn how to get along better with um, women uh, a lot more. So I have a lot more female friends now as a result. And um, 
almost everyone in my department knows who I am. And because of the program that I was introduced through the program, it was a IPP, um, PIP, which is a paid internship for someone with a disability to, so most everyone knew what I was about and who I was. So there wasn't any worry about disclosing when I first got to SMUD. So there wasn't nearly as much masking unless I answered the phone, of course. <laughs> That's great that you had that experience. Thank you mm -hmm. for sharing that. Yes. There are so many questions I want to ask you, but we need to move on to our next okay. panelist. So I'm going to hold some of them for the Q&A at the end, if okay. that's all right. Of course. Thank you so much, Jackie. That was wonderful. Thank you. Now I would like to introduce um, Cam, and I'm actually going to, he does an amazing job of introducing himself in a short video, and then we will uh, talk for a little bit. So I'm going to let Cam introduce himself in his video. Thanks. Greetings, webinar attendees, and Happy New Year. My name is Kimden Hill, and I would like to welcome you to my portion of the UC Davis Minds Behind the Mind panel. Before I get started with my portion of the panel, I would like to share some things about myself so you're more familiar with me. For starters, I am a third year student in college attending Azusa Pacific University in Southern California studying animation and visual effects. I am an aspiring storyboard artist in the animation industry. Over the years of my studying, I have done various projects like concept painting, portraits, storyboard animatics, and even animations. I've also had the privilege of being mentored by some of the industry's best directors, like Tony Bancock, who's my instructor at Azusa Pacific University. You may know him for his work because he directed Disney's Mulan, and he's also the lead animator on Lion King and the upcoming Space Jam 2 movie. And also Jorge Gutierrez. You may know him for his work on Nickelodeon's El Tigre and Book of Life. One thing you may not know about Jorge is that he is also on the spectrum like me. My ultimate goal is to become a director like my mentors and to tell stories that haven't been told through the lens of someone like me and to give a voice to those who are unrepresented on both the small screen and the big screen. The industry is ever changing in the stories that it tells. So my goal is to also educate those who are uninformed that autism is a superpower for creative storytellers like me. Thank you, Cam. I love that video with all of your examples. Glad Can you to. tell us a little bit about your experience growing up on the spectrum? So yeah, gladly. So I have a few stories to share with you guys about growing up on the spectrum. So for starters, I was surrounded by a lot of people that misunderstood my condition, especially once they heard I had autism, both family members, teachers, and friends, especially. For starters, in the classroom, I didn't really have the privilege of showing like my, like, my identity on the spectrum, especially as someone, um, uh, especially as a person of color. Like I really didn't like, I didn't have the privilege of um, like having like tantrums in class really. Like usually when other kids had tantrums when they didn't get their way, it's like, oh, like, I'm sorry. Like well, we could um, um, give you a snack or something. But whenever I had a tantrum, especially as um, an African-American kid, um, I was seen as a troublemaker. My parents were always called up. My mom was always called up to um, pick me up from the office if I even caused the slightest inconvenience in class. And I focused differently in class as well. I typically, I always drew in class. I always like doodled on my notes or sometimes even on the table with the pencil and it helped me focus. But when, uh, during times when I wasn't allowed to draw, I did other things like rock in the back of my chair or like, well, there's one time I was playing with like a piece of an orange peel. And this was back in freshman year of high school. And I remember my teacher singled me out when I was just like twiddling with an orange peel while she was talking to me. And since she like got like super like livid in front of the entire class singling me out, um, it wasn't even me at the end of class that told her the reason why. It was my friend, one of my friends that stood up for me at the end of class and informed her about my condition. And of course, <laughs> she started crying and all that. But I don't really have the luxury of having that good first impression. And it still continues to this day a lot because um, I don't, um, Actually, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go over that uh, at the end. Um, well, yeah, like I said, I don't have the luxury of messing up and there's um, a lot of people get the wrong idea of me. Like I'm sometimes brutally honest, especially when I was growing up, I didn't have the luxury of, um, of, form, of having the um, 
the capability of filtering what I say. And I took things quite literal as well. And people like to exploit that symptom of taking things literally. And sometimes it results in very bad things. Like there was one time there was this girl getting bullied and I asked like, why do you guys not like her? They told me it's because she always had lice in her hair. And we all know that's not true because if there's really lice in her hair, the school like wouldn't have allowed her to come there. Or if she was there with lice, the school would have been shut down. But of course me being me, I took it literal. And every time she was around me, I made it, I went out of my way to get away from her. And then of course the teacher saw this behavior from me and presumed that I was trying to bully her by avoiding her, but it was the opposite. And it was ironic because the teachers didn't target the people that even started that stigma of that girl having lice. They singled me out. So it's just a matter of, um, you know, a lot of misunderstanding, but I did have the privilege of being diagnosed early on. Like a lot of people didn't get diagnosed when they were kids and when they had these symptoms and people like singled them out, they had no idea why. So especially parents, teachers out there listening, if there's a kid, like if you know a kid that um, got diagnosed early, please like take advantage and like help them through these steps because if you don't, like it could definitely have an effect of them on the future. Those are really helpful examples. Thank you, Cam. How, how has being on the spectrum and a person of color affected your path in the animation industry? Man, back then, if I was a person of color on the animation industry, I probably would have stood no chance. But I'm really glad that times are evolving, especially in the industry. So I'm going to tell you guys a few stories, a few pros and cons. So as a, so a pro, like a good thing about being a person of color and on the spectrum in the animation industry is that we get like hyper focus on things. And we are relentless when it comes to getting our stories told, especially those like the artists on the spectrum or the directors on the spectrum. Like my, my um, mentor, Jorge, he got his idea rejected dozens of times by studios before it finally got picked up. And the only reason why he even got picked up was because he was persistent and he was hyper focused. And that is an advantage we always have over normal people. If we get our pitch knocked down, we will be It's a little hard to hear that last thing you said, Cam. I was saying that we are um, persistent. There's no stopping us, no matter how many times you reject us, because we are hyper focused and we could do this for days and years. But a con, however, I remember this was um, at the end of my freshman year, and I struck an interview for a job at Cartoon Network. And for some reason, they thought it was good for me to do a video interview with no one on the other side of the camera. So while my artwork was good, while my while I proved my capabilities, they still wanted me to do a video interview where I recorded my responses and submitted them with no one on the other side of the camera. While I'm speaking good right now, that's because I have people surrounding me. I have like-minded people surrounding me. I know what I'm talking about. I had time to prepare for this. But when it came to the Cartoon Network interview, I had to stare at the camera and like try to memorize what I was going to say. and. It definitely came out unnaturally, and I, and I, in the end, I didn't get the opportunity, and that's mainly the case. And especially for those who are like recruiters, presenting on the outcomes of presenting recruiters or people listening to this, like out in the workforce, please like take some take time to understand why there's like some difficulty to do. Definitely try to accommodate that. Thank you. I like the tips at the end of everything. That's great. What are your pros and cons of being a person of color on the spectrum? Well, one thing I will say, um, wait, I'm, 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 I'm hearing that I'm uh, cutting out. Am I cutting out right now? Yeah, I think if you face directly at your computer, that works the best. Is good? Yeah. Is good, okay, cool. Do I, do I need to re-say it? Do I need to restate anything or? I think that I asked you when you needed to re-say, so I think it's okay. Okay. All right. So, yeah, the question was, um, what are the pros and cons of being a person of color on the spectrum? Or what was it? Yeah. Was was it like? Yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah. What are the pros and cons of being a person of color on the spectrum? One thing I will most definitely say, and it still pertains to now, is like, we, us people on the spectrum that have that are on, that are also person of color, we have two identities. And there are times where we have to suppress both of those identities at the same time, especially right now. Um, I remember my freshman year of college, I was introduced to my classmates. 
and I was, um, I had to, I, I already came in um, trying to express myself. This is a community where I could express my artistic um, self and all of that. And throughout the semester, I felt myself more and more, I need to suppress myself because I'm, I've been told I was too loud or I've been told that um, I, I misunderstood a few things that I should have understood. And I didn't really have that luxury of messing up or I was like, they'll, um, they'll definitely single me out. And I remember one of my classmates came up to me towards the end of the semester and she told me, yeah, I'm like, I'll, I, we were, we were um, sharing our, like, our first impressions of each other. And one of my classmates came up to me and said, damn, I'm not gonna lie. When I first saw you, I thought you weren't gonna perform good. I, I thought you were gonna be the lazy kind of student, but you definitely proved me wrong. But then I thought back, was this something I was wearing? No, I was wearing merchandise. I was wearing an Azusa Pacific University t-shirt and some jeans and some shoes. That's all I was wearing. So that only leaves one more thing it's because of my appearance here. And so I have that going and I have to prove myself so I don't have the luxury of having a first impression as someone on the spectrum and someone of color. And, but a pro, but that goes into my pro, which is you get to prove people wrong. And especially if you have a passion. So like I've had people after they've learned a lot about me, they say, oh, wow, like I wish I had autism. And although it causes misunderstanding, it's a privilege to give people on the spectrum a good name and a good connotation behind it. And it's definitely, it's, de it's definitely like, it's told me that I'm, I'm, that I'm on the right route and that I'm good, that, that um, I'm doing the right thing, educating people about the spectrum. And however, with that, you, you also get people that get the wrong idea of autism. So whenever I revealed to people, especially in my family that I had autism, it was, um, they got, they immediately got the wrong idea of me. They have this connotation behind, um, they, they had this connotation that, like um, Patrick said, that I was mentally inferior and they're like, oh, it doesn't seem like you have autism. And I've had an uncle at one point when I was first diagnosed he used to refer to me behind my back as Rayman. And to all the audience out there, feel free. I'm not going to say what it is, but look up what Rayman is and you'll see the blasphemy of this. But that's, like I said, like we don't, um, those two, like being a person of color and being on the spectrum, they could go like, they can either provide really good things or really bad things. And there's no in between. Like if you have someone on the spectrum, like I said before, if they have if um, they have a sensory overload and they're a person of color, they will immediately tie it to their race before they tie it to their um, to their disability. Yeah, gives you an extra extra layer. Thank you so much, Cam. I look forward to seeing what questions come up in the Q and A. Thanks. And now I'm going to introduce Ian Rowland. He is autistic disabled, a U.S. Army veteran, a former accountant, and a disability rights advocate. He's been involved in various committees while a student at UC Davis, including the Davis Student Veteran Organization, the Disability Issues Administrative Advisory Committee, and was the chair of the Disability Rights Advocacy Committee. He was heavily involved in the establishment of both the Veterans Success Center and the Student Disability Drop-In Center, during the UC Davis Memorial Union remodel. Ian is one and a half research papers away from his bachelor's of science in neurobiology, physiology, and behavior. Very impressive, all those big words to me. He's studying American Sign Language and deaf culture with a particular interest in ASL linguistics. Thanks so much for being here, Ian. Thank you. Um, can I start by asking you, what is your experience with masking? And can you explain what masking is in case people don't know? Yeah, definitely. Um, so Patrick, um, with his video, made a great intro um, for this because masking is essentially, um, it is camouflaging. So it is behaving in a way that um, that is much more expected. Um, and there are a whole bunch of reasons for that. Um, social expectations, because people expect you to have, you know, to speak um, at a particular rate with a particular volume um, to say, to use uh, certain types of words and not others. Um, so to know what kinds of words fit the situation better. Um, so, you know, 
not greeting your your friends, you know, by walking up to them and sticking out your hands like, hello, how are you? You know, when you see them at school and you're, you know, yay high, for example, that would be considered too formal. Um, and so masking is the ability to do all of those things that aren't necessarily natural for a person. Um, and so masking is something that consumes a huge amount of my life and energy that I'm actually trying to back off on it because it takes a lot of energy um, and that's energy that could be spent um, elsewhere. Um, and that's, so that's one of the things that with being diagnosed autistic because I was, I was sort of given a soft diagnosis of um, back when I uh, was around 2010 or so, but the reason my psychiatrist at the time we didn't actually document it was I was there for ADHD assessment, reassessment. And she said, with ADHD so far, it looks like you're gonna get all the accommodations you need for school and the workplace. Um, and this was before Obamacare and the ACA. And she said, so if I put down autism in your medical record and insurance companies see that, cause you know, they, they will, um, it's automatically disqualified. You will be uninsurable for the rest of your life unless you get insurance to work. Um, and so we decided to leave it off. So, so I was sort of back there in my head that, oh, okay, like this, cause this makes a lot of sense, but I never really felt valid with it. Um, which is sort of ironic because since being formally diagnosed which I sort of fell into because of this huge burnout crash where I just stopped being able to function um, in part due to masking. Um, you know, then I, when I had that formal diagnosis and started feeling a little more okay talking about it and coming out about it, I found that the whole autistic community is incredibly supportive of self-diagnosis. Um, and so, and not having something documented on paper, it's like, hey, you know, do you have match these characteristics? Does your brain work like this? Yeah, um, so you're, you're one of us. It's kind of ironic in that sense. Um, but when it comes to, when it comes to trying to function in the day-to-day -day world. Like one of my big things is really pushing for acceptance, not awareness. Um, everyone's aware of autism as, as a word. Everybody knows it's a thing, but what actually is it like to be autistic and what is it like to be welcoming to autistic people? Um, and so with masking, one of the things that tends to happen and Cam um, sort of finished a really great point for you because he talked about you know being good or bad, there is no in between. Um, and so it tends to be that either we are the, the, the misbehaving autistic, the socially awkward autistic, the autistic that isn't fluid and doesn't blend, or with a good autistic, the savant, the one who's particularly skilled in the area, you know, we're valuable because we're great at IT, for example, we're great at coding. Plenty of autistics are awful at coding or awful at math, um, and plenty of autistics have many other skills, um, you know, but there's that that masking gap where if we don't mask well enough for neurotypicals to like us and accept us as one of their own, then we get blocked from a lot of um, opportunities that we're incredibly qualified for. Um, and this happens with job interviews, it happens with you know, uh, internship interviews, scholarship interviews, any, anything like that. Um, and so it's, it's really challenging because um, you know, here we are saying, hey, you know, like, this, is, this is who I am, but who I am, the world is saying is not acceptable. Um, and so and that's one of the things that um, I've gotten sort of a, a double hit of because I'm also trans. And so I grew up as that awkward kid um, where I, I talked too fast, I had a speech impediment, people didn't, couldn't really understand what I was saying. Um, and so when I was about 12, I transferred to a new school and, um, and suddenly people were talking over me where they'd never talked to me before. It was a, I had a class of about 20 and from, you know, going from sixth to seventh grade. In sixth grade, I was in a big public school. In seventh grade, I was lucky enough to go to a small school that had 20 people in my class. But the problem was that I couldn't find that one, the, the one or two people that I could sort of buddy up with, you know, and hang out and who understood my quirks and everything. We were fine with that. And so at lunchtime, I was being talked over all the time. Um, and I realized, um, I mean, I asked somebody, I was like, why am I getting cut off when other people are? Because I actually sat back and watched and waited like, okay, how many words do other people start with before someone jumps in? And nobody was jumping in, but they were jumping in with me. Um, but at the same time, you know, so I was, I decided, I just like, yes, I value friendships. I want friendships. And it seems like the only way to have friendships is to figure out how they all do what they do. Um, but along with that, I also was trans, so I didn't have the language for it at the time. And so I was, for me, it was like growing up felt sort of this like, I was always sort of, I was trying to fit something that I was never going to be. I was never going to be neurotypical and I was never going to be a proper girl. I tried, you know, I tried doing the things with the clothes and the makeup and the hair and I, you know, and I would see things on other people and say, oh, they look great. They look great like this. Um, but then I'd do it for myself and I just, I felt like a pig in a dress. 
Um, and it didn't matter. I could understand that other people thought I was just fine. That looked fine, but it felt just awful. And some of those sensory sensitivities, but a lot of that was also being trans and that those sorts of clothing just didn't feel, didn't feel right for me. Um, but I was trying to be things that I wasn't. Um, and I was trying very, very hard. And as a result, um, I was putting so much energy to that that I ended up becoming incredibly depressed when I was 12. And that continued all the way through, you know, my adolescence and teenager, um, you know, life. Um, and it's something that the more I've let go of things like that, and the more of like, you know, that's, that's not me, the better, um, the better I feel and the more the depression and things like that has dropped away. Well, your bio mentions that you're learning American Sign Language. Is there a connection between that and being autistic? Yeah, for me, absolutely. Um, the first time I encountered ASL was actually in a, a theater performance. Um, and something about it just felt right for me. It just felt there was a, there was a connection. And I started classes, um, oh, maybe a year later, but I lived in a really small town and there was just nobody to practice with. There wasn't really a deaf community there or anything. Um, but I picked it back up a couple of years ago and because I've, I've, always, want, I've always wanted to, um, I've always wanted to attain fluency in, in more than one other language, um, but specifically ASL. And for me, it's the first time that I can really communicate without it being painful. Um, I'm very verbal. I've been verbal since I was, you know, a little kid, just, you know, I was chatting all the time. But for me, I mean, trying to listen and process, um, there's the listening aspect where sound in general hurts my ears. And I didn't realize how painful noise was until really the last few years. Um, so sort of offshoot story. I also have a genetic disorder um, where my joints are really floppy and dislocate constantly. Um, and I wasn't diagnosed with that until I was 25. So the thing is I grew up with chronic pain, but I had no idea that what I was experiencing was pain. I thought everybody got really tired waiting in a grocery store line or gotten grouchy waiting online. Um, I didn't realize that there was anything different about that. And so the sound sensitivity is very much the same thing where until I started recognizing, oh, it's not normal to experience all these things. Um, it's not normal to struggle to dis distinguish, you know, words from what's happening in the background. I just, I can't understand. I can't, I can hear it loud enough, but I can't understand speech when there's background noise going on. Um, my problems keeping up in conversation with more than one, maybe two other people is partly the social stuff, but it's also part of the, the auditory processing. And so for me, finding ASL has been, I mean, I can, I can go to ASL socials I mean, before COVID, I go to ASL socials four nights a week and spend three hours there chatting with people. And I'd be, you know, average person kind of tired after. Um, I would go to one hearing event, you know, at a, at a party. Um, you know, I actually went to somebody's, um, they're like, I, I quit my job and I'm starting my own business, you know, congratulations, celebration party. And it was all hearing people and there was music, so it was outside, you know, and it was a thing. And I was there for three and a half hours and I was an absolute wreck when I came home. Um, and I had to take the entire weekend off. I didn't get any sort of studying done. I was still pretty messed up on Monday and Tuesday. And I liked this person and I liked the people I was there with and I was having a good conversation, but it was so overwhelming. Um, and for me, ASL really represents freedom because I also lose language because as much as I'm as chatty as I am right now and as chatty as I've seen sometimes, um, this is like, you know, people only see me when I'm at my best because I stay home when I'm not. Um, you know, I don't speak up a lot of times because I can't, it, either I can't find the words or I just can't make them come out. Um, and there's a term, I prefer to use the term selective um, or situational mutism um, because it's not really a, it's not really a choice on my part, it just happens, but it's so exhausting to try and get anything out. Whereas I can sign for hours um, and maybe I'll get kind of tired, but um, but it's not blocked like speeches where sometimes I just literally can't say anything um, or was hearing even just the feedback from my own voice is so overwhelming um, that I start something and then the rest of the sentence just it just disappears it's like it's it's like it never was um, and so finding that and and getting more involved with that has been has been a relief in so many ways. Wonderful thank you so much for sharing your perspective and I Look forward to asking you more questions with the Q&A as well. This has been wonderful. We are now going to go to our last panelist and introduce Benita Ayala. She is the proud mother of two young men. Her youngest, Christopher, was diagnosed with autism at two and a half years old. Benita also works at the Mind Institute in our UCED and our Resource Center as a family navigator. 
uh, she will help you if you call. And she is passionate about helping other family members that are caring for a loved one with a disability. So, um, Benita, I'm going to put it over to you. I, myself, Benita, identify as a African American woman and a um, mother of a young man who has actually changed my life. So, Christopher. He is a young man who is now 18 years old. Um, he identifies as a person who is um, Puerto Rican, African-American and Native American. Um, he also identifies as someone as society says, who is nonverbal. I like to use the word um, uh, first language is body language um, because um, I feel that the word nonverbal to me means that he does not communicate in any form or fashion, right? Then he also used a tablet to speak. To speak. He also is a young man who is quite tall. He stands six eight and probably is, uh, weighs in about um, 400 pounds. Um, very solid teddy bear type of young man. Mm -hmm. He uses a tablet to communicate majority of the time along with hand gestures, along with signing some things that he's learned through school um, and he also is on the spectrum and he was diagnosed at two and a half. I will say that to the prior panelists that have come on, I'm, I, I've identified with a lot of the things that they've said um, and it just opened, it made me, um, um, as I looked and, and seeing the different diversity of different people, it really helped, it really showed me how um, we all have gone through different challenges and how we identify as differently. So I will start off with saying is how I feel um, identities have impacted our life. The first thing I would say is that fear was one of the major things that impacted our life in regards to how people identified with myself and Christopher and how we had relationships, our relationships were. Um, I think for me, for me as a woman of color, raising a young African-American boy, it was always thought that I was pushy it was always thought that I was too assertive. It always, always thought that I was too, um, 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 I wanted too many different things um, that um, I didn't seem to know where I belonged or my place was, right? Um, with that type of encounter that I had through our journey, I learned that I became resilient and I learned that um, no was not an option for me because I knew that my son deserved all that um, was entitled, that he was entitled to have. So with that being said, there's a lot of things that are incurred with how people identified with Christopher. Um, some of those things were like, um, most of the times I would tell you that autism was not the first thing that I think that I would say that um, had made difficult challenges and changes in our life. I was always dealing with the simple fact that it was either because of the color of his skin or his height. And it always created fear in all aspects of our journey. Um, fear into the simple fact that it, if the first time if something occurred, similar to what Cam said is like, everything was always a behavioral issue. Everything was always some type of challenge where he could not be taught. Um, I was called tremendously a multitude of times um, to pick him up from school because he was not acting in an appropriate manner. Um, not realizing that, you know, with having someone who cannot communicate his needs and wants met, there's always some type of frustration. I would always tell people, if you went to a foreign country and you had to use the restroom, how would you tell them if you could not speak their language? At some point, you would get frustrated, right? And you would, there would be some type of action or behavior that would occur during that time in order to get to the point to find out where the restroom is. That's how I view when Christopher enters out into the world where he's frustrated and not being able to get his need being, needs and want met, where he's misunderstood in a manner that people take his banging or take the fact that he claps his hands too loud or he's humming in the store that um, there is something that um, um, it's taken in the wrong type of um, light and, and connotation. Um, when people can come up and feel comfortable that they need to express their fear to you. Um, to where in the school district, you know, people feel that it's okay to share the, the simple fact that, you know, 
your child won't be able to learn. Um, your child won't be able to, um, you know, he, he, because of his language, they felt that he would not, does not understand what's being said or what's being happening around him. Um, and I will say with, through this journey, one of the biggest things that even with Cam spoke about is to prove people wrong, prove people the fact that just because someone does not speak the same language or speak in the manner or communicate in the manner that you feel that is uncomfortable, that is where you think is universal, right? That they can't learn, they don't have that capability, you know? So because of that, there was a multitude of relationships that have occurred through the years that they first judged by the appearance of what they had in front of them. Um, there was a multitude of times that people would share with me that, you know, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm fearful, so I don't know um, if um, he's understanding me. They're speaking around him in these manners, you know. When you speak about someone in a manner, in a negative type of manner, confrontation, you know, that can sit with people. It sits with someone knowing that. It sits with them. So obviously you could get a reaction or you can get a response out of someone just out of that manner. Also the simple, I would say that part of the challenges was is that it was hard to trust people. Trust was a great issue for me with all the multiple ways of how people identify people because of the simple fact I always had to allow, I always had to trust Christopher, trust who I was, when I was sending him to school, that they would be, um, what they would first see him as a young man, as a human being, as someone that deserves to have, to be treated in a manner that was the way they wanted to be treated. And I will say that that, with that, multiple things occurred that, that, that I struggled with having that trust relationship with people. Whereas he was bullied, you know, whereas people would, teachers would call and say to the point, and this is what I meant by identity, where I think people felt more privileged that they had a capability to say whatever they want and it would be okay. And those things became hurtful, you know, and it became making me feel that how can you trust someone how can you trust a system that does not, does not look at you as in a manner that you're, where, where you're human or a manner to where you deserve to be present or a manner where you deserve to be somewhere? So I will tell you that um, trust was an issue when it came to how people identified with Christopher, how they identified with me. It, it may be on high alert. I am a parent, a single parent, who is constantly on high alert because of the fact how people identify with us. Because of this fact that my son is, and it's not really always, it's not necessarily the primary is autism. It's usually, Robin, you can keep strolling through as you, if you can with the pictures, is usually it's because of, um, my high alert is usually because of the fact people feel that they need to come and share these negative type of comments and what have you with me um, in regards to Christopher. So because of his size and because of how he looks, I was always on high alert and um, going out in the community and dealing and engaging with people, not knowing what they're thought and what they're thinking. And I will tell you with Christopher, as society says, nonverbal, and I always say his first name, which is body language, I'm going to stop in my, my speech and talking for a minute because this picture that I showed with you right here happens to be on the UC San Diego campus. And I sh wanted to share this picture because Christopher as a young man is so observant of his, his surroundings and curious and his mind is always constantly going. He wants to know. And this is a statue that is on the campus um, at UC um, San Diego where his brother graduated from. Um, and this is when we were dropping his brother off at school. And I was so fascinated that the fact that he was stopped there, he was curious about who she was holding in, the, in, in, the, in her hand and what have you. And this is part of how this young man is, his curiosity and his, his, his love for, for being, for his, how he's so in, in tune to things out in the community that to me, that's his learning tool. He's a visual learner. So one of the reasons why I show or wanting to show these pictures is because he's visually learns things. And I'm hoping when you 
hear my story and hear the pictures. You can continue, Robin, as you see how he experienced in so many different ways. I want to stop and show with this one. He learned how to swim by just me verbally telling him, Christopher, because he's so tall and he can be in the deep end, all I need you to do is call dog paddle. Move your hands and your feet and kick. It took one day, less than 30 minutes. And the reason why I share some of these things, you can continue, Robin, is because what, how I identify this young man is so different than how his community and people around him um, identify him. Because the first thing that comes that they see is the visual. He is big, is tall, um, right? And because he's a, a young man of color, even to the point when I use training with officers and minded, I know that they would be candidly honest. They would say, to, the first thing they said to me is that, wow. And I would say, what is your first thought? He said, the first thought was, is how would we ever take this young man down? And to me, um, that just created more fear because one of the things that I was trying to do is, is I want my son to be in a safe environment. I want him to be in a safe world. But how can you be in a safe world when the very people that say that they will protect and be here for you, that they could say those things? And I know that they were just being honest. But one of the things I wanted to do is teach to change that mindset and that thought process, right? Um, so for me, um, the relationships that we've built through the years, they don't get me wrong, there have been some phenomenal ones. But I think some of the ones that could have been better is if that they would not, if they would not see him as a young man and see fear, but yet see the potential in him to see the um, the capability in him to see that there is a person that, that can learn, but he just does it differently. To not use the simple fact that he's not able to communicate, meaning that he can't learn. Do not use the simple fact that he's not able to communicate, that he doesn't hear you, right? Um, so for me, um, it has been the multiple identities and how it has impacted our life and our relationships has truly has been a challenge in so many different manners. Um, but I will say that having him has been a blessing in so many different ways. And it has changed me, has made me stronger as a mother, has made me resilient as a mother and has made sure that I continue to press through to um, fight for what I believe is right for Christopher. And I thank you all for listening. Thank you, Benita. <laughs> Thanks to all our panelists for being so forthcoming with your story. It's so wonderful to hear uh, and really appreciate the depth of your sharing. Also, thank you to our listeners for being a little patient as we have a couple of screen freezing internet issues, but luckily we got to see all those amazing pictures of Christopher. Um, I'm going to go now to some of the questions in the Q&A. We have actually quite a few questions about masking. Um, so I am going to throw a couple of these just out there to the panel. Um, someone wanted to know how the isolation of COVID has affected your ability to mask. Um, and interact with neurotypical people. This person is autistic and feeling a little out of practice. So I wanted to hear um, how you all are doing with that. Ian, you wanna go first? Uh, yeah, sure, I guess. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm willing to answer most anything. So I wanna give other people, other panelists a, an opportunity to. Um, so impact of COVID on masking. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's been interesting because in some ways it's, it's a bit better because I don't have the constant stress. Like I'm not, you know, going to a campus four days a week and burning myself out that way. Um, because even in, in like my ASL classes and my deaf culture classes um, for for ASL, it was great because everything is, it's, it's you know, fully signed all the way. Um, you know, I have deaf professors for all of my classes, um, but um, 
but there's still environmental noise. Um, you know, there this in my campus, we're having construction right next to our building and this other building they were setting up just the whole time. And so I'm always, you know, like wearing, you know, wearing earplugs and stuff like that. But um, but it's still still challenging. So in some ways with COVID and being home, I don't have to do I'm not bleeding out so much energy just with everything all the time that in some ways I'm I'm better. Um better. I I hate equating masking with being a better state, but I'm I'm probably better at masking in some ways because of um, because I don't have all those other stressors. But at the same time, there are other situations where it's like, oh, I'm out of practice, like speaking with people. Um, and I would say I'm actually because I'm not going out, my ability to function in the environment has gotten. Um, and my ability to process multiple types of stimuli has degraded, like going to the grocery store um, is now much more overwhelming for me than it used to be um, because I'm not accustomed to it. So in some ways that's, um, that's been a bit of a challenge but also because I wasn't expecting it. Um, so many things are different. Um, was there, was there an advice part to the question or? I think that was what they were wondering. Thank you. It yeah. sounds sounds like it's a difference and that we we uh, should make sure when we go back into the world that we're all going to get used to it slowly. Jackie, I have a 13 year old wondering if um, asking, will I have to mask in order to get a job? OK, so it depends. Uh, can you hear me first of all? Mm -hmm. OK, perfect. Um, it depends on the job. So if you're say you're working at Safeway doing the bagging of groceries, there's gonna have to be a certain way that you interact with your customers. And same with say working at a movie theater, you don't, maybe you don't tell them what you think of the movie. You just saw things like that, little little mini rules like that. But um, it depends on the job, honestly. So there are some jobs that require a lot of interaction with all kinds of people that you're, you know, that a lot of what you're doing depends on that interaction. And then there's other jobs that it depends just on the job you're doing. So it depends on the job. Um, personally, I found that finding the job that's right for you is the best, you know, part and your happiness and showing that you're happy at your job and everything like that. Um, will usually come through no matter what kind of, whether you're masking or whether you're just, you know, doing the job and interacting with people. I find that um, people just, over time, you can start to slowly lower off that mask just a little and then a little more and then a little more until you can kind of don away with it a little bit. Um, yeah, so uh, you are 13, so, um, it's kind of, you know, at 13, I was pure id. So it, I feel like you have a lot to go since you are a young, youngin, but um, there is a lot of growth that happens from 13 to say 20, 25, 30. Um, and so what you see of yourself now will be very different than how you may be in 10 years as well. Thanks, Just Jackie. Saying. Yeah. <laughs> Cam, can I ask you a question? We have um, somebody wondering if, if you think there's a certain age that a kid should know about their own autism diagnosis, or is earlier better? Honestly, I think, um, I think it is good that they know if they're on the spectrum early, early on, so that they could like contribute to their development as well like that's how it was with me is how it was with me and so like it's almost like a sense of closure too like if they know like if something's going on and they're like oh, okay like you know like i gotta um it helps them with their development it helps them with um helps them with learning about themselves because even after i was diagnosed like i don't think i was told that i was on the spectrum till like fifth grade and um, I was very oblivious to like what was like going on. And I was very oblivious that I was, um, that the symptoms I was showing out was like repelling people away from me. And, and um, it was something that I had to learn about. 
So you think knowing this helped you do that? Yeah, because I've seen a lot of like adults as well. Like my mentor, Jorge, he didn't get diagnosed till he was 40. And it was one of those like, oh, moments for him. And it was like, he, like you know, like it'd be a good goal to like avoid that oh moment. Like when it's like super far down the line when you could have like prevented any kind of like incidents from happening or any kind of like um, problems from happening. Thank you. And we had a parent ask, um, say that many times this parent feels as if her son who's on the spectrum can read her feelings um, and understand social cues, even though she's been told that autistic people can't read social cues or other people's feelings. And she wanted to hear some thoughts on that. I love empathy questions. I really do. Um, so yeah, and you are absolutely right with your your intuition and um, and your observations with like with your child. Um, that so there's the the social skills aspect and then the and also the feelings aspect and the empathy aspect. So like many and I'm so I'm hooked into a large number of autistic led. Um, groups. Some are support groups, some are, are parent education groups. Um, but I, so I see comments and read threads all day long. Um, and that's where I get a lot of my education because um, it's something that I learned as being part of the chronic illness community too, is that nobody will have experiences like the people who are actually experiencing the thing itself. Um, and so there's a huge diversity of opinions that I'm, you know, that I'm exposed to, that we all are exposed to. Um, that you don't find in the literature really, um, partly because nobody until very recently has been asking the right questions in my opinion. Um, so for us, um, you know, when it comes to feeling things, yeah, many, many, many of us discuss um, having hyper empathy where for example, like I can't watch cringe humor, um, the type of humor where people are, you know, people get hurt and it's funny, you're playing a practical joke on somebody, um, you know, or, um, I remember this actually happened um, with a, a group that I was sort of vaguely associated with in sixth grade where somebody's birthday, a girl's birthday was coming up. And so the rest of the group decided they're gonna be really mean to her on like the, during her birthday, um, except until the very end of the day where they were gonna surprise me like happy birthday. And I thought that was awful. Um, I was like, why would you be mean to something like, oh, but you know, but then she realized we weren't actually being mean. We actually really do like her or not. And I'm like, that's awful. Um, I don't care what your justification is like, that's just terrible. Um, and a lot of us are are like this, a huge number of us who are like, no, we feel things very, very deeply. Um, the issue can come in with how to express it. Um, I, one of my partners is, um, uh, I mean, doesn't have a diagnosis, but absolutely matches, um, you know, criteria and everything else inside similar sort of things. And, and he described, um, being in um, in a grocery store with uh, with his ex wife, um, they were you know still married at the time, and a woman had I think two kids and a basket and some other things. So she dropped it, and the basket spilled, and his then wife immediately went over to help her, and he stood there frozen because he wanted to help. He wanted to do something, but he didn't know what to do. And that's what a lot of us encounter is that it's not that we don't feel things or it's not that we don't care. We, many of us, a huge number of us care very, very deeply um, and are very strongly impacted by things, but we don't know how to display that in a way that other people recognize. Like he was frozen. So he asked his wife and she was like, how did you do that? How did you know to do that? Um, and so, yes, we feel things um, incredibly deeply. It may not always appear in ways that neurotypical people recognize. Um, yeah. And the same with the social skills thing where I made social skills one of my special interests because I wanted to know how people did the thing. And I was like, oh, you all are friends with each other and you're not jumping over each other. So how do I do that? Um, and so for people who, for autistic people who have an interest, yeah, we absolutely can pick up social skills. Um, and if it's a particular interest of someone, I say, go ahead, there's nothing wrong with that. But at the same time, I don't feel that we should be pressured to behave how neurotypicals behave just because neurotypical is the majority. Absolutely. Thank you, Ian. Benita, we have some questions from parents. <clears throat> One question was about what the most helpful programs you found for Christopher. Um, I will tell you, I would not say that I found many that were helpful um, due to the fact that majority of the times, once he was there for a period of time, people would always um, ask him to uh, leave. 
or have me pick them up. Christopher had a very um, really intense program up until probably uh, elementary school with ABA and in-home and what have you. Um, but what I'll tell you what I did do, um, as a single mom, I always kept him out in the community. His oldest brother was a fencer. So for me, I always made sure that he was always continuing to be out in the community. And it wasn't just his community. Um, good examples, when we'd go to a Target, I'd go to a Target that would be in Roseville. Most of you are not here, but just say from a different those of you who are not from this area, just say if you to a store that was either 15 or 20 miles away, because I was the one that wanted to make sure things are just not just in your community, right? Um, so I do those type of things. I did have them in other type of sports. We tried all different types of sports to, um, to baseball, to golf. Um, we did swimming when he was younger. So it's basically me creating those um, uh, programs that I kept him involved constantly. Um, the more other stuff that were more intense stuff were things that were like speech and OT, occupational therapy, music therapy. Those were things that were just kind to help him through the process of different um, challenges that he had. Um, but a lot of the programs are ones that I found were um, locally from sports to um, trying to get him acclimated in other social groups. Um, but most of the social groups were a hard time because I struggled, struggled with because most people didn't know how to I shouldn't say no how, it was a challenge for them to get into the communication, communicating with him through the device and what have you. And I felt that a lot of people didn't want to take the time to do that. And then when he would get frustrated, there was a fear factor that came out during that time. So um, it was just me um, finding those uh, opportunities myself. Thanks, Benita. And we did put some of um, some parent support group information in the chat for people as well, because it sounds like a lot of advocacy is needed. Jackie, someone asked if you felt accepted when you were talking about um, being with other women and girls. Um, at first, I didn't know what to think um, because uh, there were such, I, um, in a way they kind of, um, a lot of them were older, like uh, decades older than me. So they kind of took this like almost like a mama bear like just you know guiding me and you know um of course but um some of them that were my age there was kind of this kind there was um you know someone came up to me did you hear that this person said this about you and then you know she was hoping that I'd get upset or there'd be some drama and it was like really like that that's what she had to say like that's the big horrible thing okay <laughs> it was because I had eaten nachos with my hands so I wrote a note to myself eat nachos with fork afterwards, you know, and just stuck it on my cubicle and, you know, things like that'll come up. But for the most part, um, I've been told that I've influenced the job and the environment. Like they're happy to have me there. Um, Great. Thank you. I'm a little less afraid of being around neurotypical people because I was bullied really badly in middle school, high school, and at the sheltered uh, workshop, so. Oh, I know, thank you, yes, and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you, Jackie. Yeah. Cam, what are some things you wish your teachers knew about you or understood when helping you? Definitely that I most likely won't understand it the first time around. There are times where I say like, okay, yes, I do, but it's mainly it's like, okay, let me try it out with this angle, at this angle. And then there are often times where I'm like, um, where I'm afraid to come back for more help because there have been countless times, especially especially in math, like with the new integrated math stuff that came out when I was in high school, where I'd come back and ask for help another time and they'd be like, oh, it's because you were drawing during the classroom. Oh, it's because you were you know, leaning back and forth in your chair. And it's like, it's really because I need to, I need to explain it differently than when we did earlier. But usually they regurgitate what they said before. And I'm like, no, I need it. I need you to emphasize on this. And there are times where I'm definitely a visual learner. So if it's math, I need to see you write out the equation and don't just tell me how to write it out, or um, if it's English, I need to see an example essay and don't just tell me what to like how to how to write it out and what angle I need to approach. Like, yeah. So definitely, um, 
if your student needs, like if your person, like if your student on the spectrum needs like clarification on things, definitely explain it in a more specific light. Definitely um, find ways to visually educate them as well. And yeah, that, that's all I got to say on it. Thanks, Cam. That's really helpful. And we have quite a few questions about um, either where to find support or how we as a community can support people who are trans and autism or other gender identities and have autism. Do you have any thoughts about that? I do. I've been seeing some of those questions. I'm trying to hold on to trying to hold on to the wording of at least one or two so I can hopefully be a little bit specific in my answers. Um, one thing is recognizing there are huge numbers of trans and gender non-conforming autistic people. The research is just coming out about this, but much, much greater um, uh, you know, uh, rates of being non-cisgender in, um, in the autistic population um, than compared to the neurotypical population. It's coming out, it's, um, it's really quite significant. Um, I don't want to give you an exact number, but I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 20% the last paper that I read about it. Um, and of course, I don't have any of my articles right here because organiz digital organization is an endless nightmare for me. It's like, I know the stuff exists, where did I put it? Um, and so part of it, would, I think, is, um, is first of all, just being aware of that, that to be trans or gender non-conforming um, in our population is, is actually quite common. Um, and that's something that, you know, and there's also been a lot of discrimination against um, autistic people based on, um, there's been a lot of gender discrimination. So people say, oh, you can't be trans because you're autistic. You just don't understand what gender means. I'm like, that's an incredibly insulting and demeaning um, perspective to take, um, to believe that we don't understand gender because we're autistic and therefore we couldn't be trans or we couldn't be gender non-conforming. Um, you know, we couldn't be, um, we could, like in my case, I'm, you know, I'm not binary trans male, I'm trans masculine. Um, and there's a little, and so it's like, I'm sort of fall somewhere in the non-binary ish spectrum, but it's easier to just say it, but I, but I'm also, but I'm trans, um, I'm just not hardline binary, but there are many, many people who are denied, um, gender confirming, um, uh, treatment who want that because, you know, doing a medical transition is not mandatory. If you are trans, um, you can be trans and exist, exist exactly as you are. Um, it depends on what you personally want for yourself. Um, about people who've been denied, uh, you know, transition services who want them because they are autistic. Um, and so that's something that um, I think first of all, this is one, this is one case where I would say, yes, we really need to focus on awareness um, that, you know, uh, um, that yes, we can, many of us can be trans, but also um, here's, a, here's one of the issues with, um, when it comes to intersectionality and, and identities that people tend to be single issue thinkers. They think that if you are, um, uh, you know, if you are, you know, queer, if you are gay, you aren't going to be disabled. Um, if you're low income, um, you know, you must be straight or, and I'm not giving the best examples right now, but, um, but recognizing that, you know, what happens in like a lot of LGBTQ centers, they end up being very white focused and same with disability centers and disability studies, they tend to be very white focused. And it's so people forget that, oh, wait a second, you have people, who, you know, queer people who are non-white, you have queer people who are disabled. Um, you know, you have disabled people who are non-white, you have disabled people who are queer. And so within a lot of these, you know, LGBTQ centers um, and groups, you have um, people who, it ends up being very white centered, very able-bodied centered. And so so it ends up being very exclusive um, and shuts out people who are who don't fall into those categories. Um, so in the case of being autistic and queer, um, make the place open and welcoming to autistic people. The UC Davis Mind Institute was founded in 1998 with the promise to reduce and prevent the disabilities that can be associated with autism and other neurodevelopmental conditions. Every day, our clinicians and researchers make progress on that promise. Our groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other conditions associated with disability are helping affected individuals achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website or our social media platforms to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.